From VOA Learning English, this is the technology report. A new report says businesses around the world are not keeping up with new and tricky methods of computer crime. The international technology company Cisco Systems released the report. It said businesses are trying to prevent computer system security breaks using old technology and policies. The report describes big mistakes businesses have made in trying to stop computer attacks. Cisco examined 115,000 devices. It says almost all of them had security weaknesses in their software. Jason Brevnik is a top engineer at Cisco Systems. He told VOA that computer criminals will attack systems owned by a company or an individual. He said criminals will work together to target a computer system and steal information. Brevnik said, companies are starting to guard their computer systems continuously. This helps them identify and quickly answer attacks. He said, many companies do not discover attacks until 100 days or more after they happen. However, Brevnik said, new programs are able to identify attacks within hours. Tara Sinclair is with the jobs listing website Indeed.com. She says computer attacks have caused a large increase in the need for computer security experts. The company Symantec is the largest seller of security software in the world. It says the number of people needed for computer security jobs will grow to 1.5 million by 2019. Cisco's Jason Brevnik told VOA that universities are training students for the growing computer security market. For VOA Learning English, I'm Ann Ball. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. California Governor Jerry Brown wants to increase partnerships between his state and China. The governor traveled to China recently to seek Chinese investment in things like high-speed railways, renewable energy, and electric vehicles. He spoke at China's Tsinghua University. The governor called for a partnership between the United States and China to develop technologies to reduce greenhouse gases. Governor Brown met with Prime Minister Li Keqiang and China's Minister of Environmental Protection, Zhou Shengxian. Mr. Brown and Mr. Zhou signed a non-binding agreement to share information about policies to reduce pollution. Pollution is a leading concern in Beijing, where officials advise people to stay indoors when air pollution levels are at their highest. California's biggest city, Los Angeles, has successfully reduced the problem with smog that the city had for years. Its efforts included improving its vehicle emission standards. The state also offers special incentives or rewards for clean energy policies. Last year, California 
held its first sale of carbon credits under the state's greenhouse gas reduction law. The law requires big polluting industries to buy credits to release carbon dioxide, methane, and related gases. Governor Brown also hopes to create 20,000 megawatts of renewable electricity by 2020. California-based environmental scientists and representatives from environmental consulting firms also attended Governor Brown's speech in Beijing. They say rising air pollution levels in China make it a good market for technologies that help to reduce the problem. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Development Report. Sunday, October 10th, was World Mental Health Day. This year's observance centered on the relationship between mental health and chronic physical conditions like diabetes and cancer. The World Health Organization says more than 450 million people suffer from poor mental health. The most common disorders are depression and schizophrenia. Mental health experts also include other disorders, like drug and alcohol abuse, that affect millions of people. Elena Berger is with the World Federation for Mental Health. That organization, based in the United States, held the first World Mental Health Day in 1992. Mrs. Berger says mental health problems are most severe in poor countries that lack the resources to deal with them. She says in developing countries, a huge number of people, up to 85 percent, cannot get any form of mental health treatment. Experts say about half of all mental health problems first appear before the age of 15. The countries with the highest percentages of young people are in the developing world. That means they are also the countries with the poorest levels of mental health resources. The WHO says many low- and middle-income countries have only one child psychiatrist for every one to four million people. Worldwide, depression is the leading mental health problem and a leading cause of disability. In 2002, the World Health Organization estimated that more than 154 million people suffered from depression. But Elena Berger, from the Mental Health Federation, says other kinds of diseases often get more attention. She says people pay more attention to communicable diseases and not enough attention to mental health conditions. She says these are real disabilities where people are not able to work to their full ability and cannot earn an income. So there is a strong effect on families as well. Mrs. Berger says her organization and the WHO are pushing to have governments include mental health care in their development goals. She says this could greatly improve the availability of treatment and services worldwide. She says people with mental disabilities would be recognized as groups that need special support and not be excluded 
and ignored. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. Prime Minister Hun Sen of the Cambodian People's Party joined the online social media site Facebook three months ago. Recently, he announced he had three million likes on his Facebook page. Now, Cambodia's ruling party spokesman has dismissed a report that the Prime Minister unfairly increased his number of Facebook likes. Hun Sen appears to have overtaken opposition leader Sam Rong Si's 2.2 million likes. Rong Si, head of the Cambodian National Rescue Party, has been on Facebook for at least five years. A report released by the Phnom Penh Post newspaper said that only about 20% of Hun Sen's likes were Cambodia-based users. Many of the likes came from people outside the country. The report raised the question that the Prime Minister might have been buying his support on the site. Mie Mose is head of the Internet Technology Department at an online rights advocacy group. He explains that Facebook users can pay money to advertise their Facebook page, a method known as boosting. Chuk Sopiap is executive director of the Cambodian Center for Human Rights. She says that a politician's popularity should not be judged by social media activity, but by their work as public officials. Hun Sen has been in power for more than 30 years. Political observers say Hun Sen is hoping that he can use Facebook to gain popularity. Important local and national elections will be held in Cambodia in 2017 and 2018. For VOA Learning English, I'm Jonathan Evans. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. Mia Le Tai is a scientist at the University of California, Irvine. She recently discovered a process that could result in batteries lasting forever. Tai spoke with VOA Learning English about her discovery. She said she was not happy with the lithium ion batteries in her wireless devices. She said that over time, they lose their ability to fully charge. She said this is because the batteries use nanowires. The small wires are extremely thin. A human hair is a thousand times thicker than a nanowire, for example. As a result, nanowires break easily but they are also effective carriers of electricity. Tai had a theory. Nanowires might last longer if covered. She and her team at Irvine experimented with many coverings. They found success with PMMA, a hard, clear plastic material. The nanowires covered with PMMA cycled through charges 28 times more than uncovered nanowires. 
The PMMA covered wires showed no evidence of damage after 200,000 cycles. The results suggest that batteries with covered nanowires might last forever. For VOA Learning English, this is the last technology report for Learning English TV. But we are not going away. We will continue to bring you videos to help you learn American English. Go to learningenglish.voanews.com to find new materials and to look for past Learning English TV reports. I'm Carolyn Prasuti. Thank you for watching and learning with VOA Learning English. From VOA Learning English, this is the technology report in special English. China recently said it considered launching a drone strike against a Burmese drug trafficker. Na Cam was wanted in the killings of 13 Chinese sailors on the Mekong River in 2011. China's top drug official said the plan was to bomb the drug dealer's mountain hiding place in northeastern Burma using unmanned aircraft. The official said the drone strike idea was passed over in order to capture Na Cam alive. He was seized last April in a joint operation with Laos. That China considered using a drone strike is a sign of its increasing development of unmanned flight technology. It also suggests that China is seriously considering using drone attacks outside of its borders. Peter Dutton is with the United States Naval War College. He says China is moving away from its earlier policy of non-interference in international affairs. He says the country is becoming more active in protecting its interests beyond its borders. The United States has led the world in drone technology for years. It is known to use UAV, or unmanned aerial vehicle strikes, against foreign targets. In recent years, China has greatly improved its UAV technology. It showed off many of its new models at a recent air show in the country. One of the drones has a range of over 3,200 kilometers. China is also modernizing its global navigation system to compete with those of the United States, Russia, and Europe. The United States exports unmanned aircraft to only a few of its closest allies. China is now seen as an increasingly reliable, lower-cost supplier. Several countries have bought or built their own UAVs, mostly for surveillance purposes. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. From VOA Learning English, this is the technology report in Special English. China has new rules that require people to use their real names when registering for Internet services. The rules also require Internet companies operating in China to remove material said to be objectionable. Chinese lawmakers approved the measures on December 28th at the end of a five-day meeting of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. The new rules say network service providers must 
strengthen management of information released by users. The providers have been ordered to stop the spread of banned information and to deal with the problem. The Xinhua News Agency says those steps include removing the information from the Internet and reporting it to the government. Chinese officials say the rules are aimed at protecting the personal information and stopping abuses like junk email. But critics say real name registration will discourage individuals from reporting corruption and official abuses because they are afraid of possible action against them. The new internet regulations go into effect as the Chinese government campaigns against virtual private networks, or VPNs. Some reports say the government is increasing its effort to block VPNs. Duncan Clark is an advisor to Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. He says there is often an increase in Internet censorship during sensitive events, like the recent 18th Communist Party Congress, which named China's new leaders. He says these periods are normally followed by reduced enforcement. But this time, he says, it is unclear if that will be the case with the new leadership. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. The Internet is one of the most popular forms of technology. But can using the Internet have the same effect as taking a drug? The answer seems to be yes in at least one country. China says many teenagers have grown dependent on the Internet. China calls them Internet addicts. In fact, China says that Internet addiction is the biggest threat to its teenagers. Some critics even call the Internet electronic heroin. In 2008, China became one of the first countries to declare Internet addiction an official medical condition. Experts released a report that defined the condition or disorder. It said people with Internet addiction disorder spend more than six hours online doing something other than work or study. Based on the definition, China has over 20 million Internet addicts. The condition has led to the creation of over 250 camps within China. They are designed to treat young addicts. The camps treat the country's young addicts for their dependence on the Internet and video gaming. Teenagers can spend three to four months at a camp. Once there, the patients are required to do demanding physical exercises and take medication. Some patients reportedly are placed in rooms by themselves for up to 10 days. Shash Shlam and Hilla Medalia are filmmakers from Israel. They released a documentary called Web Junkie. It tells about the internet addiction camps. Their film was produced at the Daxing Treatment Center in Beijing. China is not the only country dealing with internet addiction. South Korea has opened over 100 treatment centers for teenagers. 
For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Technology Report. A new internet training center in Togo will give young people in that part of West Africa a chance to improve their job skills. The International Telecommunication Union and the computer networking company Cisco Systems launched the center. A telecom company in Lome is also taking part in the effort. Robert Shaw of the ITU says students will learn the basics of what he calls the real plumbing of the Internet. In January, five instructors completed two weeks of intensive training known as the Cisco Certified Networking Academy. They also learned how to train others. Robert Shaw says this kind of train the trainer program helps meet a growing demand for professionals in information and communication technologies, or ICT. He said, the internet and these networks are growing so fast it's really hard to keep up and the rate of change means it's very difficult for the classical educational programs to keep up with the demand that's out there in the marketplace. Mr. Shaw says recent years have seen an even stronger demand for these kinds of programs in the developing world. He said now there are about 2 billion users on the Internet. The majority of those, about 1.2 billion, are in developing countries. That is almost the complete opposite of what the situation was five years ago. The ITU launched its Internet Training Center program in 2001. The centers are meant to help spread the growth of ICT jobs to developing countries. More than 80 centers have opened in the Asia-Pacific area, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and Africa. Mr. Shaw says the new center in Lome will open to students in March. He said one goal of the program is to get more women and girls to take part. So the program targets at least 30% female enrollment. Other locations in Africa include Angola, Cape Verde, Kenya, Malawi, and Mali. They also include Rwanda, Senegal, Tanzania, Mauritania, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. Students pay for the training. The cost is different in each country. Those who complete the program are known as Cisco Certified. The program lasts about six months because most students attend part-time. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can comment on this story at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at VOA Learning English. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. Workers at the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant in Japan will soon begin another cleanup effort. More than 1,500 nuclear fuel rods are to be removed from a damaged storage pool 30 meters above ground inside the Reactor 4 building. TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, owns the nuclear power station. Critics say TEPCO should not be trusted to carry out the operation. However, TEPCO General Manager Maiseyuki Ono 
says the operation has been carefully planned. TEPCO had to rebuild the Reactor 4 building after a hydrogen explosion destroyed it. TEPCO workers will first remove pieces of wreckage left by the explosion. Then workers will remove the fuel rods one by one. They will use a crane suspended above the building. The fuel rods must not touch each other or break. Nuclear experts warn that any accidents could cause an explosion many times worse than the one in March 2011. Mitsue Murata is Japan's former ambassador to Switzerland and an anti-nuclear activist. He notes that problems over the past 30 months, including radioactive water leaks, have raised questions about TEPCO's efforts. He says, if the worst happens and workers have to withdraw, then it could be considered what he calls the beginning of the ultimate catastrophe of the world. Japan's Agency for Natural Resources and Energy says TEPCO alone is responsible for safety. But to support TEPCO, the agency has sought advice from specialists around the world. Nuclear inspectors have approved TEPCO's plan to remove the fuel from Reactor 4. The process is expected to begin in November and be finished in 18 months. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. China's Tianhe 2 supercomputer has been rated number one on the top 500, a list of the world's most powerful computers. Experts measured the supercomputer's performance at 33.86 petaflops, or quadrillions of operations per second. China's National University of Defense Technology developed the supercomputer, which runs twice as fast as the number two rated Titan supercomputer. That machine belongs to the U.S. government's Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the southern state of Tennessee. Tianhe 2 and Titan are part of the race to make supercomputers faster and more powerful. So what is a supercomputer? A basic personal computer has one microchip at the center of its operations. This central processing unit, or CPU, carries out a set of commands as part of a pre-designed program. The first supercomputers had a few more CPUs. The number grew as microprocessors became cheaper and faster. Andrew Grimshaw is a computer science professor at the University of Virginia. He says many supercomputers today are called parallel machines. Instead of one CPU, they have thousands. These parallel machines are made up of many individual computers called nodes. They are positioned in one block. They use a lot of power, create a lot of heat, and require huge cooling systems. They also use programs different from the ones used by ordinary computers. Professor Grimshaw 
says anyone with enough resources can build a supercomputer to solve problems that require millions of mathematical calculations. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. This is the VOA Special English Development Report. Market researchers estimate that more than 1 billion personal computers are in use worldwide. Availability has improved in developing countries, but still remains limited compared to industrialized nations. Experts continue to debate how best to close this digital divide. Nicholas Negroponte established the One Laptop Per Child project in 2005. He would like to put a low-cost laptop in the hands of every child, especially those living in extreme poverty. His nonprofit organization has shipped its specially designed laptop to developing countries around the world. He says it is already in the hands of more than 1 million children in 31 countries and 19 languages. And one country, Uruguay, has just completed doing every single child in the country, he says. But the program has critics. They say trying to supply every child with a laptop, even at the current price of $160, is costly and inefficient. Stephen Ducker also makes low-cost computers, but his can run programs and applications for several students at once. He says these virtual desktops lower costs, reduce energy use, and lessen the need for technical support. His company, N Computing, says it has set up over 40,000 networks in more than 100 countries. Stephen Ducker says all you need to connect to a network is a keyboard and monitor. You think you've got your own computer all to yourself, he says. Instead, users are sharing the resource and doing it at a much lower cost than having their own PC. As computers reach more children in developing countries, so too in many cases is the internet. It can be a great educational tool. But children also need to learn about the possible threats that can be found on social networks and other sites. Mark Matunga is with Microsoft East Africa in Kenya. He says poverty may put African children especially at risk. They are being told, hey, you know what? I can send you a few dollars. I can come and visit you. I can buy you a ticket. You come to my country. His company is working with the Kenyan government and a children's rights group. Mark Matunga says the coalition is trying to educate the public about how to protect children from online abuse. And that's the VOA Special English Development Report, available on Twitter and Facebook at VOA Learning English. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. The war in the Gaza Strip is being fought as much on the Internet as it is on the ground. Some people say the increased use of social media is changing the way people look at the conflict. Palestinian activists recently put a video on the YouTube website. 
The video shows rescue workers trying to help a Palestinian boy look for his family. Suddenly, the boy is seen lying on the ground. The video claims he was shot by Israeli gunmen. A second bullet appears to kill him. The video was shared on social media. Palestinians and Israelis have fought before, but now Palestinians are telling their war stories directly to the world through social media. Lisa Goldman is with the New America Foundation, a nonprofit group. She says Israelis have used Twitter for a long time. She says Palestinians on Twitter is a much more recent event. Yusuf Munayer heads the Jerusalem Fund, a pro-Palestinian group. He says that earlier news reports about the Middle East were generally pro-Israel. But he says active social media work by Palestinians is changing how traditional media report the news. The Israeli government understands the power of this new technology. Jed Shein is the social media director at Israel's embassy in Washington. He warns against thinking that social media truly show how the public feels about issues. There is little scientific evidence to prove how effective social media is in reporting about the conflict between Israel and Gaza. Lisa Goldman says it is important to have news media professionals report from conflict areas. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. The modern way to collect signatures on a petition requires no paper or pen or standing on a street for hours. Change.org and other websites let people start or sign online petitions. There are many different reasons why people start petitions at Change.org. The top causes range from animal protection to criminal justice to women's rights. Lauren Todd of New York started a petition a few months ago after she saw a picture of a girl's shirt on Facebook. The shirt read, I'm too pretty to do homework, so my brother has to do it for me. As Ms. Todd told CBS Television, it was outrageous enough to be posted on Facebook but it was actually more outrageous than that. And I felt like I needed to do something about it. Her petition urged shoppers to boycott J.C. Penney stores until they stopped selling shirts with what she called sexist messages. Five hours later, Shelby Knox started tweeting about the petition to her thousands of Twitter followers. Ms. Knox is the director of women's rights organizing for change.org. Some of her followers also started tweeting about the shirt and signing the petition. Ms. Knox says, from the time that Lauren started the petition on change.org and JC Penney pulled the shirt, it was about 10 hours, in which it got over 2,000 signatures, and at one point was generating over 400 tweets a minute. She said that with each new signature, an email automatically went to J.C. Penney's public relations team. Another went to the company's chief. J.C. Penney, without comment, discontinued the shirts. Clothing designer John Noon has worked with a number of large stores. 
He says he has always used words like pretty or princess when he creates shirts for girls. It's easier to sell a shirt that says my little princess than my A student, he says. But now with the internet, consumers who take offense can do more than just write an angry letter to the company. Another clothing seller, Forever 21, got in trouble not long after J.C. Penney. Forever 21 was selling a girl's shirt that read, Allergic to Algebra. It stopped selling them the day after the story spread. Robin Sacken is a professor at New York's Fashion Institute of Technology. She says children are influenced by their parents, not the words on a shirt. So if my child says to me, Mommy, I want to get that, I've said, okay, you can have it, but just remember something. I don't care if you're pretty. You're doing your homework. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. Benjamin Stassen took his own life in 2010. His parents thought their 21-year-old son was happy. Since his suicide, they have attempted to learn why he killed himself. Alice and Jay Stassen thought Benjamin's Facebook account might hold clues to his suicide. But the account does not belong to them, nor did it belong to their son. Facebook owns everything in his account. That is what the company says in its user agreement. Jay Stassen says he found it difficult even to communicate with Facebook. If you search on the home page of Facebook for an email address, a mailing address, a phone number, or a contact person to help, he says, you will find little information. A court ordered the company to let the Stassens see their son's account, but Facebook has yet to obey the order. 34-year-old Mac Tonys died in his sleep in 2009. He left behind a lot of online friends, many of whom liked his futuristic blog, Post Human Blues. Work on the blog stopped when he died. A short time later, the comments area was filled with unwanted advertising. That angered his friend, Dia Sobin. He said the advertising, or spam, dishonored his friend. Lawyer John Boucher stays informed about digital rights and the law. But he admits that he and his wife have signed many user agreements without reading them. He says he would not know how to get information from his wife's accounts if she dies. Mr. Boucher says he thinks that laws will be written over time to deal with these situations, but it will take a long time to be accepted by the states. Some businesses now are offering people a way to control what happens to their online information after they die. One way to do this is to place your online accounts and passwords in a digital storage area. You give the owners of the area orders about which information to destroy and which to give others when you die. Mark Platner was one of Mac Tony's friends. He recently used a program called Sight Sucker to download Mac's blog. He then uploaded a copy of the blog to a new website under his control. Mark Platner says we should all plan our own digital legacy.
He says, don't be passive. Get to work on your online afterlife now. And that's the VOA Special English Technology Report. You can leave comments about this story at voaspecialenglish.com. I'm Carolyn Prasuti.